let's go ahead and do some vocal warm ups. Very good. Wow, I definitely need a vocal coach. La, 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 la. Yeah, you might have to practice a bit there, but otherwise. Vlad, are you getting permission from Julian to be less empathetic? I wouldn't say that I don't have any empathy at all, but when I communicate, I always make an effort. Yes, definitely. Uh, I gave a TEDx speech some years ago in Athens, the home of democracy, and it was called The Sound of Democracy. And the proposition is that Democracy rests on civilized disagreement. One in six American teenagers suffer from noise-induced hearing disorder as a result from headphone abuse. Surround yourself with nature sound if possible. That's now proven by research to be very good for you. The sound of running water, birdsong, those kind of sounds are really good for us. I certainly abuse my headphones. Considering the fact that nowadays social media platforms often create echo chambers. Hearing is a capability, listening is a skill. It's a skill that we've developed over the years and we've just dropped it. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. I'm your host, Anya Chowdhury. And Vlad Suleiman. Today, we have the immense pleasure of hosting a renowned sound and communication expert, Julian Treasure. With a deep passion for sound, Julian has dedicated his life to helping people and organizations listen better and create healthier, more effective soundscapes, including enhancing our speaking abilities. As a sound and communication expert, Julian is on a mission to transform the world by inspiring conscious listening and powerful speaking. He is the author of two acclaimed books, How to Be Heard, and sound business. Julian's impact can be felt globally with his five TED Talks amassing over a hundred million views. His talk, How to Speak So That People Want to Listen, is one of the top 10 TED Talks of all time. In 2003, Julian founded the Sound Agency, an innovative audio branding company that answers the essential question, how does your brand sound? Julian's love for sound can be traced back to his days as a drummer for indie bands. Before the Sound Agency, he spent 20 years in advertising and magazine publishing and founded the contract publishing agency TPD. Julian, welcome to the show. Thank you, guys. Lovely to be here. Thanks. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. Julian, my first question, do you still play the drums? I do, not so much in a band since I moved to Orkney. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of music up here, a, a huge amount of folk music, but it's more uh, barons, uh, fiddles and whistles and things like that. So drum kit, not so used up here generally. Um, so I don't play mm. as much as I used to, but I do have a kit at home. I keep my hand in. I love that. I, I have to say, I surf the internet and listen to some tracks from back in the days when you were playing the, the drums and sometimes even the, the back of vocals. I have to say, I found a track that I absolutely love. In fact, I woke up today in the morning. I've played it already four times. It's been like my, so my meditation routine every morning is to listen to music. I, I, I love that. And so the track that I love so much i don't know if you remember it but it's called bite the bullet from the transmitters wow, um, <laughs> yes. that's, uh, not a meditative track that's a pretty full-on track transmitters was uh, oh. a very kind of edgy band uh, very 
very spiky, edgy yeah. sound. That, <laughs> that's exactly why I love it. In fact, if you take a look at my tracks, none of them, no one would ever think that I use for meditation purposes. But in fact, it, it's certainly a meditation to me. Well, my favorite statement from you is, and you made many amazing, incredible statements, but one of the statements that I think is my favorite are, is years are made not for hearing, but for listening. And you mentioned that listening is the sound of democracy. Can you elaborate on that idea and its significance in today's society? Yes, definitely. Uh, I gave a TEDx speech some years ago in Athens, the home of democracy, and it was called the sound of democracy. And the proposition is that democracy rests on civilized disagreement. If you're going to live next to people with whom you disagree, and there are more of them in the country than you, the, their rules apply. And it's unfortunately, uh, it's a way of being that is starting to get rather lost in a polarized world. Tolerance of other people's different views is based on understanding. And understanding is the inevitable outcome of conscious listening. And conscious listening in this context really uh, has got an element that I think is getting very lost in the world, and that's validation. So you may reflect what somebody's just said. You may say, oh, well, I heard, what, what I heard you say is this, or, you know, okay, so you, you think this. The validation piece is, whilst I don't agree with you, I totally understand why you would think that. I get why you have that position. I accept that that's what you believe. It's not what I believe, it's different. Unfortunately, in the modern world, there is an epidemic of invalidation, which is to say, that's just nonsense, mm. that's wrong. And, uh, you know, that's a slippery slope. There's a great quote from, quote from Barack Obama when in his inauguration speech, his acceptance speech, he said, I will listen to you, especially if we disagree. Um, and that is a rarity now. Most people are keen to listen to people with whom they agree, and that's being exacerbated uh, by the ease of finding people with whom we agree on the internet. So I think listening is the sound of democracy because without listening, what you have is constant conflict and you have a slippery slope which goes mm. all the way down to you know, the ISIS position, disagree with me and I'll kill you. Uh, and along the way, you have depersonalization, caricaturing people, you have, um, you know, polarization and hatred and, you know, not accepting people who are different, mm -hmm. who have different views. You can't have a democracy if that's the way people are. What you then have is anarchy and combat and violence and hatred, which are things I mm -hmm. think most people would rather avoid. So listening is the key that unlocks the door to civil society, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so conclude uh, the sound democracy is important, is importance of sound in democratic processes, and it encourages individuals to become more conscious of the sounds that surround them. Uh, so with that being said, my question is how the rise of technology particularly social media, has impacted the way we listen and communicate with one another in a democratic way, considering the fact that nowadays social media platforms often create echo chambers where individuals are exposed only to opinions that align with their own and people become less willing to engage or listen to the views that differ from their own. So what's your opinion on that? Well, I think that's absolutely true. And it's a sad feature of social media of the internet that uh, it creates these silos of opinion where people dive in to be surrounded by people who think the same thing and that can result in extreme perspectives i mean we've seen this uh, so many times with conspiracy theories uh, extreme world views which are rather strange um and that you know that that's based on people going and finding and saying, there you are, I knew I was right. Thousands of people agree with me. Yeah, well, millions don't, but you, go, you don't go and seek them out. So this, this polarization, this siloing of opinions 
is very much down to the ease of finding the people who agree uh, worldwide, which never would have been possible before. You know, you might have had a view that's shared by 10,000 people worldwide, but you would never meet them. And it right. would be more a case of synthesizing different views around you, perhaps talking to the people who were closer to you physically, who you could actually meet or discuss things with. Well, now uh, you can sidetrack all of that and just go straight for the people who believe the same things you do on a Facebook page or a, a bulletin board of some kind. So I think that that's definitely degrading this ability to listen to difference, which I was just talking about. And uh, there, there are other aspects of technology which concern me. I mean, I don't know if you've come across Sherry Turkle, professor at MIT, who was also a TED speaker, uh, who I met at, at TED when she gave her talk called Alone Together, which is also a book. And that's very much about the phenomenon of, you know, a family sitting around a, a, a table at a mealtime and everybody's looking at their hand and nobody's talking to anybody and they're all communicating with somebody who's not there. So that's the concept of alone together. You are together, but you're all alone because you're off with mm. people who aren't present. Um, and that, you know, that's kind of a sad paradigm that a lot of the time when you see people in restaurants with their phones out and then the, the, somebody will talk and it's about what they've just seen on their phone. So the phones become <laughs> the stars of the show and it's not so much about connecting with the people who are actually physically present. And then there's the always on culture that we are in where you know, I, I'm I'm quite ancient now, and I grew up in a world where letters were sent in the 60s, 70s, you know, before mobile phones existed. Um, and you'd expect a, an answer within a few days. Well, now, of course, you, you know, there are people who get emails from work late at night. I mean, hours of work have kind of evaporated, and there's this always-on thing. People do sit up doing email in bed just before they go to sleep. Mm instead of talking to their partner or whatever. Um, well, there's a great book by Nir Eyal. I don't know if you've come across it called Indistractable, which is a superb long essay on this and how to avoid it in life, how not to be distracted the whole time. Because these, you know, these are huge corporations who are spending billions constantly right. with one aim, and that's to grab your attention. That's the commodity that they want. Uh, you're not, you know, using them. You're not a customer of them. You are the meat for them. You're, you're the product because then they yeah. can sell advertising. So th there's a huge force trying to grab attention all the time. And listening is something which, you know, there's a great quote by Scott Peck, who wrote that wonderful book, The Road Less Traveled. He said, you cannot truly listen to another human being and do anything else at the same time. Now, that is challenged by something in our hands, something on our desks, screens around us, all these distractions of technology and, of course, the polarization. So there's a lot of stuff going on with technology, which I think challenges our listening. And uh, it plays into one of the big habits of humanity, uh, which you know I'm sure teachers have to avoid uh, more than most, actually which is the desire to be right. And being right is behind an awful lot of the violence mm. and the judging and condemnation, uh, the what I call blame throwing that goes on in social media and in you know mainstream media as well, where somebody's to blame. This is outrageous, this sort of addiction to outrage that we have where somebody must be punished. Well, of course, that's all about making people wrong and if I make you wrong, it makes me right. And it elevates me and it diminishes you. And I feel better about myself. It's an ego driven thing. And if that's what is going on underneath a huge amount of the communication that uh, technology is enabling, being right, making people wrong, it's it back on that slippery slope again. And there's a wonderful TED talk actually by John Ronson, uh, who I had the pleasure of working with on a a great TED talk called The Psychopath Test. Well, he gave another one, which was about social media shaming. And I do urge people to watch that because it's a terrifying paradigm of, you know, the pack dog mentality that people get 
I mean, this isn't just about individual trolling. It's about packs of people going after a target and piling in and destroying somebody uh, who made a mistake. Wow. Didn't mean to, but did make a mistake. So given that, you know, written communication is so easy to misinterpret, I think this is a fairly dangerous and shaky area that we're in uh, where you know, a lot of techno, a lot of technology is about written communication. There's a great deal of misunderstanding, and there's this being right and judging and siloing going on. All of those things, we have really got to try and push back by raising the profile of conscious listening, compassionate conscious listening. How how exactly then do we train ourselves? to be more conscious listeners. I mean, especially we've just talked about the world filled with distraction and noise, but what is what are the steps that we can take, right? What are the steps that we can take to be conscious listeners? The very first thing is not so much a step as a realization. So it's a transformation of a perspective that we all have or that many people have. People conflate hearing and listening. Hearing is a capability. You hear everything unless you've got damaged hearing, which is another conversation because that's an increasingly huge problem in the world with noise induced hearing loss, especially with headphone abuse, especially among young people. And we need to teach them about that. Uh, but if you can, if you haven't got damaged hearing, you hear everything. You don't listen to everything. Listening is not a capability. It's a skill. So hearing is a capability. Listening is a skill. And that is a crucial differentiation because a skill is something that you can teach and you can master and you can practice with enormously positive effects in life. You know, we've been speaking and listening for hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, Homo sapiens has been around for 300,000 years and our distant ancestors going back 3 million years. Uh, writing was only invented 4,000 years ago, max. So for most of human history, all of our communication has been speaking and listening. It's primal. It's a skill that we've developed over the years, and we've just dropped it, particularly in the last 40 years with email and text and instant messaging and so on and so forth. So that's the first thing to realize is that it's a skill and we all owe it to ourselves to set about mastering it. Why we don't teach it in schools is a complete mystery to me. We teach reading and writing. It's a scandal if children leave school unable to read or write. We do not teach speaking and listening, hardly at all, hardly ever. I mean, I, I'm sure there might be a few teachers listening to this and going, I do. Well, right. you're the exception because the vast majority of schools focus only on reading and writing and they don't teach speaking and listening hardly at all. So, that's the first thing to realize that it's a skill and it needs to be taught. Uh, the second thing to realize is that every human being's listening is unique. It's as unique as your fingerprints. Your listening is different from mine. And it's a very common and grave mistake to assume everybody listens like I do. They don't because we have mm. a set of filters we listen through. And those include the culture we're born into, which might be the family, it might be a tribe, it might be a, an area, a, a locality, a town, a city, a, a state, a country, whatever the culture is, that culture will determine a lot of your listening. And then there's language you learn to speak. And then as you grow, there are values, attitudes and beliefs that you pick up from teachers, from parents, from role models, from friends and so forth. Some you pick up, some you throw away. And everybody's come a different road you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people listening to this. Every one of you has come a different road to listen to this conversation and you're all listening in a different way. And again, once you realize that, then that opens an enormous conversation really about, okay, everybody listens differently. So I need to ask myself, what's the listening that I'm speaking into? That's a very good question for a teacher to ask in a class. And it's a great question for a teacher to teach children to ask when they're speaking to each other or eventually if they stand up in front of the class or if they're talking to their parents, what's the listening I'm speaking into? 
then you can start to design the way you talk and what you say much more effectively. And that's how you hit the target instead of missing it altogether. There are some practices. Uh, if you look at my TED talk on listening, there's, I think, five practices I recommend in there. And I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, silence. Very important to be with silence. Not so easy to get these days unless you live very rural. So possibly tranquility. It might just be a quiet bedroom or a, a bathroom or somewhere you can sit quietly for five minutes, not say anything and just let your ears settle and give them a rest. And that helps you to listen more acutely. Surround yourself with nature sound if possible. That's now proven by research to be very good for you. The sound of running water, bird song, those kind of sounds are really good for us in lots of different ways, as well as being nourishing to the ears. When I was inst instrumental in launching a company called Mood Sonic, which does this for offices, which puts in generative uh, biophilic sound, nature-based sound for open plan offices to make people uh, uh, feel more comfortable. And also it's more productive because it masks unwanted conversation quite well. Uh, or if you're in a personal space, like you're at home, there's a lovely website called My Noise, um, which was instigated by a lovely man called Stéphane Pigeon. And uh, that is a fantastic source of lots of lovely sound that you can use to work to uh, or to concentrate to or just to relax to. So that's a really good thing to start to cultivate a listening practice to silence or peace or tranquility or nature sound. And the other exercise I'd suggest uh, is one I call rasa, the Sanskrit word for juice, which stands for receive, appreciate, summarize, ask. R-A-S-A. -A. So receive, this is a listening practice really in conversation. Receive means look at the person who's speaking. You know, in the in the Western world, generally, the dance of the eyes is the person speaking will look around the room and, you know, check back from time to time to see if you're still listening and then look around while they're thinking and so forth. The listener, however, is looking at the speaker all the time. And if not, it's a strong indication they're not interested or they're not concentrating or not engaged. Mm -hmm. Particularly, you know, there are people in the FBI and other uh lie spotting specialists who are very trained to look at things like, are your feet pointing to the door? You know, are you moving? Is your body edging away? You know, are there signs of disengagement or discomfort? So body language, very important. Look at the speaker, lean forward if possible a little bit and look interested. And then we have appreciate. And that's the little noises we make in conversation like, Hmm. Oh, really? Ah, now, you're not doing that to me at the moment because we're in a podcast and it gets in the way generally if people are doing that, like on radio, it's not done. But face to face, we all do that. Or gestures, nods, smiles, eyebrow raises, those kinds of things that oil the conversation. And then the S of Rasa is summarizing. It's the word so. So what I understand you just said is this. Is that right? Or so we've all agreed on this. Now we can move on to that. So it's a very good way of closing doors in the long corridor of a conversation or getting group agreement if you're in a group uh, and being able to move on to the next thing. Or summarizing so that people can understand what's been said. And the final A, ask questions, open ended questions. Why, what, where, when, which, how, who, all those lovely words that don't allow the, the answer to be yes or no. And that's a great way, by the way, uh, for uh, of engaging people uh, when they're not really listening to you, is asking questions. Well, that's very interesting. What aspect of what you just talked about relates to this thing I do know about? So you can build little bridges like that and make connection with people. And by being interested in what they say, if you're listening to what they say, it tends to make them more prone to listen to you. So that's some ideas of how we can become more conscious in our listening. So you, you've just mentioned that there is also cultural differences in terms of how we listen and how we communicate. So I want to share the story about myself and I want to ask about the uh, empathy. 
So I was born and raised in post-Soviet Union country, Uzbekistan. And I feel that my circumstances were so, so such I grew up with a lack of empathy. I wouldn't say that I don't have any empathy at all, but when I communicate, I always make an effort to be more empathetic, especially when it comes to my employees and team. And uh, as a business owner who is constantly in contact with my team, my question is how can I, I effectively balance authoritative communication with empathy and compassion in my interaction. Perhaps what strategies can I employ to achieve this balance? Well, that's a great question and a great story as well, because it's really important to understand the cultural differences that exist around the, wo the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it's really important to understand the cultural differences that exist around the world in listening as well as speaking. And I talk about the cultural differences in speaking quite a lot, where, for example, prosody or prosody varies enormously, very restrained in Scandinavian countries where, yes, we are really excited about this. You know, that's kind of as as wild as it gets. Whereas in Mediterranean countries, you were, ah, da, 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 and all this kind of thing going on. So speaking is enormously different from culture to culture, but so is listening. And it's without getting too much into this, I know that uh, there are uh, cultures, particularly former Soviet countries, where uh, empathy was never d encouraged, really. And, uh, you know, I've certainly met people from those countries who find it quite difficult to empathize. And that means you do have to concentrate, as indeed you are, Vlad, and I, I commend you for doing that. So the first stage in balancing authoritative speaking and compassion, empathy, and so forth, is to be conscious, is to be conscious and to ask the question I just talked about, what's the listening I'm speaking into? So what's the most effective way I can be in this conversation? And you could also uh, turn that around and say, what's the most effective listening position I could have here? Is it an empathic listening position? Is it a critical listening position? Uh, you, you can listen from different places just as much as you can speak in different ways. So being conscious of all of that and asking yourself that question, what's the listening I'm speaking into, really does open your, uh, your ability to moderate and to speak appropriately to those people and to, you know, you don't lose authority, but what you may do is get across far better. So it, it, a lot of this is just about getting the ball over the net really it's it's about making sure your message is received and that you're not setting up traps or blocks or uh, resistances to it by speaking in an inappropriate way it's very important to understand that speaking and listening are not a straight line it's not i speak you listen straight line between those two things speaking and listening are in a circular relationship so the way i speak affects the way you listen the way you listen affects the way I speak and the way I listen affects the way you speak and the way I speak affects the way you speak as well very often uh, and particularly if we're mirroring and matching which we do automatically so you know if you're talking to somebody who speaks very very quickly you tend to speed up yourself and if you're talking to somebody who's very slow then it would be really really wrong to speak like this to them I mean they would feel enormously pressured so do you see what I mean? It's about being conscious of the listening you're speaking into and the listening you're giving to other people. And that circle is dynamic and it's happening all the time. And listening positions, of course, the listening you're speaking into changes. It changes from person to person, from group to group and from time to time. You know, we listen very differently. if We've just had terrible news compared to if we've just had great news. And I can tell you as somebody who speaks on platforms a lot around the world, you know, the listening of an audience at 9 a.m. is very different to the listening at 2 p.m. just after lunch, for example. Mm -hmm. So you have to be conscious of this and that's how you can balance the empathy. The intention is enormously important. You know, the intention to be empathetic, to have compassion is crucial and if you've got that intention you're more than halfway there 
I'd like to add here. So if I would like to deliver the message correctly, I would have to understand their culture. Yes. So from where they are coming from. So let's say yes. some of my team is also from post-Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually it commonly accepted there. If you are too empathetic, it's equals you are weak. Yeah. While in America, it's a little bit different. So basically I have to adapt to the culture I'm speaking with, right? Yes. And if you've got half and half, that's going to be more of a challenge, in which case you might need to take that face on with the people and talk to your post-Soviet uh, colleagues and say, look, we're in America. I'm going to be speaking in a very compassionate way. It's not the way I would speak to you back home. And I'm doing this for a reason, you know, so that I think it's very powerful often in public speaking to draw back the curtain and let people know what you're up to. It's not a performance. I mean, the objective is to get the message across and achieve your intention. And obviously, whenever we're speaking, you know, I will have my intention for me. I will have my intention for you. I have to guess your intention for you. So there's three intentions going on all the time. And if you can guess the audience's attention, intention and engage them in your intention, you know, it's often good to say, right, what I'm setting out to do here is this. This is my intention for this next hour or 10 minutes or whatever. Uh, then, you know, you're, you're kind of letting people know what's going on and they, they feel part of something rather than just the passive recipients, uh, people being manipulated or whatever it might be. So, uh, yes, I do understand the dilemma that you're in there. And it may be that if you're back in Uzbekistan and speaking to post-Soviet people, you might be a bit more brutal and less compassionate, uh, a bit more straightforward. Um, well, you know, if it's a mixed audience, uh, I think my previous comment applies. It's, it's more complex. Vlad, are you getting permission from Julian to be less empathetic? <laughs> no, I was asking how to be more empathetic. I, 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 I want to force myself even more to develop this skill. Well, you, you, you certainly should, because that is the only way to be, to be an effective communicator, in my opinion. Uh, but I, Julian, I'd love to talk about the concept of sodcasting, which is imposing your sound, imposing our sounds on other carelessly. My question is, are people sodcasting consciously or are they doing without realizing and if it is without realizing for those who are listening right now or those who will watch uh, this cl particular clip that we will post how can someone know if they are sodcasting <laughs> i mean i think most people who sodcast are unconscious of it i certainly hope so i mean i think it's very mm, unpleasant to okay. consciously sodcast and just to to define this new English word sodcasting, it means um, imposing unnecessary noise on people around you. It might be, um, you know, teenagers on a bus playing music through a tinny mobile phone um, loudspeaker and upsetting people who are sitting around them. It might be a business person in an airport. I mean, I've experienced this many times. So, you know, you're sitting in an airport <clears throat> and there's somebody having a conversation on their phone, uh, very often on a headset attached to a phone, walking up and down and speaking as if the phone didn't exist and they've got to make themselves heard over hundreds of miles. So broadcasting their conversation and um, you can see the kind of rolling eyeballs of people as the person comes back this way again and the conversation um, dominates your whole existence for a few minutes. And that's just unkind. And it's thoughtless. And the answer is to become more thoughtful and more considerate and more appreciative of the fact that sound impinges on the people around us. We have no ear lids. And unless mm. I'm wearing headphones and listening to something else, whatever you're saying right next to me is very clear to me. And, uh, you know, I'm, I am often stunned by the conversations people will have in public about medical matters or financial matters, <laughs> very personal stuff in a train or on a bus or somewhere um, and where everybody else is listening. It's kind of... Um, rude 
in that the premise here is that nobody else matters. These people are insignificant. They're ciphers. They don't really exist for me. And I'm just getting on with my life. Well, they right. do exist. And I think it's very important to, to be mindful of um, the fact that other people do exist. And they're all listening. They can all hear perfectly well. So here again, I think it's cultivating a listening way of being. And there's an exercise that uh, I recommend, which is called savoring. And just like we savor food, you know, you put something in your mouth that doesn't taste good, you spit it out. Well, we're very numb in our ears after years and years of noise around us and, and visual dominance in our culture. Our ears have kind of gone numb. So savoring is a really good practice. Well, you can do it at home. Anybody listening to this, uh, go into each room in your house, close your eyes and listen to the soundscape there and ask yourself, is this the absolute best soundscape I could have in this room? And you may discover little hums or buzzes or noises which have been doing something like that for years and years and you've never noticed them before, but they're not doing you any good. You know, hums and buzzes don't help. Uh, they just slightly irritate you. <laughs> um, so you may discover sounds you don't like. You may also start to discover what I call the hidden choir in sounds around you, which are very mundane. You know, in my talks, I use a shortened version of a kettle boiling, which is a really interesting sound when you get through the whole journey. I mean, there's an arc, there's a story arc. It has a beginning, a middle and an end. And then in the UK, that end is a nice cup of tea generally. So it's, you know, happy end as well to the, to the story. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a very rich sound. There's a huge frequency range in a boiling kettle and it's quite a pleasant sound when you start to listen to it. So that's a silly example in a way, but I'm making the point that there are sounds around you that you can start to enjoy and which you've ignored in the past. Mm. So savoring is very much about trying to, take responsibility for the sound that you consume so that you eliminate sounds that are unhealthy or unproductive and you start to surround yourself with sounds that are healthy and productive. And as you start to become more sensitive, more of the time to sound, then the chance of ever sodcasting, imposing sound on other people is really reduced because you would start, you'd immediately think, oh, hang on, <laughs> that's really going to upset people and you won't do it. Okay, at the beginning of the interview, uh, we were speaking about how um, it is important in schools and for teachers to uh, teach the skills, listening skills and speaking skills at school. And uh, in your TED talk titled, How to Speak So That People Want to Listen, you stated, we teach our children how to read and write, but not how to speak and listen. I share the same sentiment and I agree 100% with this. Do you have advice for elementary school teacher, teachers or any of any exercise they can start implementing in the classroom to start the process of developing our listening skills for elementary age students? I do. Uh, this is something that's very important to me and I'm, uh, I'm continuing to work on it. Um, and indeed, I've got better than advice. I have a draft curriculum, which I'm going to make available to you guys so that you can uh, disseminate it to the audience that you have, because I can't think of a better audience than hundreds of thousands of teachers across the world, hopefully, and certainly in the US. So the curriculum is largely aimed at younger children, but it will work through. Uh, you can pick and choose things from it. It has exercises in it and uh, things to watch and so forth. Broadly speaking, it covers explaining why hearing and listening are so important and explaining the difference between them. So, you know, what is the impact if we lose our hearing? What's the impact if we're not listening? And those are really profound. You know, hearing loss, which I, I said earlier, is going to be a bigger and bigger problem in the world with noise-induced hearing loss, with, uh, with headphone abuse particularly, but also industrial and work-related noise. Uh, there are going to be, according to the World Health Organization, billions of people in the world suffering from that. And hearing loss is a terrible thing. It creates immense loneliness and disruption because 
if you can't hear people, you can't communicate. And there's a great stigma attached to it that only a very small proportion of the people who need hearing aids actually apply for them because of embarrassment, social stigma. So hearing is precious and we need to really get that message across to children so they don't ram earbud headphones in and put 100 plus decibels of noise into their ears for hours a day, which is what many, unfortunately, many young people are doing and flattening those tiny hairs in, hairs in the cochlea and uh, destroying their hearing. So hearing is vital. We have to protect it. Listening is a critical skill, especially listening to people who are different and starting to try and understand them. It covers um, teaching perhaps some wondrous facts about sound. My, my new book is, is going to be out next spring. It's going to be called Everything is Sound. And uh, I've just sent the manuscript to the publisher actually last week. And I'm really excited about it. It covers sound in space. There's a lot of sound in space, surprisingly. The sound of the earth, uh, the sound of living things on the earth, and the sound of people. And there is just a huge, you know, thousands of amazing, wonderful facts and, you know, extraordinary things about sound. I mean, simply, you know, most people don't know, for example, that sound travels four times faster, more than four times faster through water than it does through air and much further, which is how whales are able to communicate over hundreds and hundreds of kilometers or miles, even from one side of an ocean to another almost, or at least they were, until we started uh, deafening them with cavitation noise from ship propellers. There are something like 60,000 ships out there at any given time. And we've created a dense fog of, and we, we're deafening the cetaceans and they can only communicate over much shorter distances now. So little things like that, they're great things. You can really engage children in that. And it's part of, you know, an ecological awareness, which children very much need. And then the cur curriculum has got lots of fun exercises. Uh, some of the ones I've talked about savoring. Um, memory games you can do with sound lists you know can you remember these words and so forth rasa of course listening positions so there are lots and lots and lots of games and ways of listening uh, i developed that actually with a teacher in uh, who, who's in florida and i will make it available to you and i hope teachers enjoy it and can use some or all of it in teaching these critical skills to children i want to focus on a uh poor acoustics in the classrooms. I ran across a video, it may, it may be about 10 years old, old already, where you mentioned because of poor acoustics, students in classrooms may miss nearly 50% of what their teachers say, which is absolutely, that's, that, is, that is crazy. Now, is that still true? Because now we're fast forward 10 years later, we're now in 2023. Are schools still not set up acoustically correct? Are there still students that are unable to hear a large percentage of the information that the teachers are actually teaching? Sadly, the answer is yes. Wow. And, uh, you know, architects are very visual people. They, they, in the US, they train for five years and they might spend a week on acoustics. Often it's only a day and five years. When they are putting their work up for awards or trying to show their work to clients and win contracts, it's all visual. Sound is not mentioned at all. And that's why in schools, in hospitals, in offices, uh, in all sorts of workplaces, we have utterly inappropriate soundscapes, acoustics, which create hideous amounts of noise. And it is particularly a problem in education. There's, um, you know, the evidence from Germany shows that the average noise level in classrooms now is 65 decibels. Now, that's not deafening. It's not going to cause noise induced hearing loss. But I would have to raise my voice constantly to get over the top of mm. 65 decibels. That's quite it's a loud conversation. I wouldn't be shouting at the top of my voice, but it, it would certainly be well raised. Now, the research on the effect of noise over time on human beings shows that 65 decibels is the threshold at which that level of noise, if you're chronically exposed over a period of years, 
increases your risk of heart attack and stroke. So we're here looking wow. at a situation where teachers working in that environment, which is quite common now with group work and poor acoustics, they are potentially shortening their lives by working in that environment. There was a case also in the UK not so many years ago of a teacher who sued because she lost her voice completely as a result of having to shout the whole time in a, a schoolroom with terrible acoustics. And the answer is, no, I'm sorry, it hasn't got better. Not, not to my knowledge. There are standards uh, which are supposed to be applied, uh, but they are only guidelines and there's no policing of them. There's nobody mm. going around checking that the reverberation time in classrooms is less than half a second, which it should always be. Uh, and, or that the noise in the classrooms should be under 60 decibels, which it should always be. So unfortunately, the situation hasn't improved dramatically. And of course, it gets worse as you go back in a classroom. The further away you are from a teacher, the more the room is in play and the less you can hear the original signal. Right. And who sits at the back of the class? It's the naughty kids. So those are kids who are, you know, they may not be very engaged in their education in the first place when they certainly can't hear it. So it's like watering a garden and missing all the flowers, unfortunately. You know, the teachers are yeah. doing their very best. They're sending. I'm sure they're hugely professional in what they're outputting. But sending is only half the equation. It's got to be received. And if the room itself is counteracting that, well, what a disastrous situation for everybody concerned. It creates stress. It creates ill health. And it leaves children bereft of an education. So it's a disastrous situation. And it is still endemic. I mean, there may be schools with lovely, quiet wow. classrooms, well acoustically treated, but most of them, hard walls, hard floors, hard ceilings, square, you know, parallel surfaces, glass reflects as well. So windows, there's nothing soaking sound up. Um, there are some things, you know, things you can do even if you can't get a room acoustically treated with sound absorbing panels, for example, um, bookshelves help, plants help. Those things definitely help. Any soft furnishings, curtains, cushions, whatever it might be, all of these things help enormously. Uh, but, you know, we really don't want to get to a stage where teachers have got to have microphones and PAs in order to be heard in loud classrooms, because that will just make the noise even louder. So, yeah, I'm sorry. It is still a major problem. <laughs> wow. That is absolutely bizarre. And it is a topic that is never talked about. And not only that, I, I'm afraid that in a couple of years, Julian, you may, you just might be right, even though it's a joke now. I would not be surprised if there's some kind of amplifier, you know, whether it's a, a mic and a, and, a, and a mini speaker, whatever the case is. I, I, I think we're headed down that path. It is absolutely ridiculous. On that topic, I, I do only have, Julian, two last questions for you. And the first question here is, and this actually scared me because I, I, I am a part of this problem, which is one in six American teenagers suffer from noise-induced hearing disorder as a result from headphone abuse. Now, I, I, my, thankfully, my, my hearing is at, well, I, I would say 100%, but I don't know, but it, it's still healthy at this point. But I certainly abuse my headphones. And I think it's a very important topic to talk about because it's not a topic that is often talked about. Can you briefly just talk about headphone abuse? Because I think myself included, we love to blast our music and it's not for five minutes. You know, it could go up to, you know, an hour, sometimes even two hours. Yes. And when you do that, as I said earlier, you are effectively flattening the little hair cells uh, in your cochlea, in, the, in your inner ear. Um, and once they're destroyed, they don't grow back. So it's, unfortunately, wow. it's like eroding ice from underneath. You don't realize there's a problem until you go through it, and then it's too late. There's no way back from that at the moment. I mean, there are people investigating using stem cells to regrow the cilia, but that's a long way off yet. I wouldn't hold out much hope. Hearing aids have got yeah. hugely better but they're expensive 
And uh, although the new ones are very smart and they can detect different environments and even let you listen to music, uh, nevertheless, that's not, we don't want everybody <laughs> wearing those. <laughs> so we need to teach children, as I said earlier, about the importance, the fragility and the importance of hearing, how to look after it. And the basic ground rules with headphones are that if you can't hear somebody speaking to you in a loud voice from, you know, a couple of feet away, a meter maybe, it's too loud. So if you've got the headphones really cranked up and people are just completely silent to you, that is too loud. And if you're on the outside, if you can hear this sort of coming from headphones that somebody's got on, it's too loud for them. Now, I don't advise you tapping them on the shoulder and saying, do you know your headphones are too loud? Because you'll get a very crude response in most cases, I'm afraid. Um, but if it's you, you can look after your own ears and you can look after your children's ears. So my tips, first of all, monitor the volume. There are now um, in most wise headphone suppliers, they have limiters that can be set for particularly for children, which will set a maximum volume and a safe maximum volume mm. also headphones um are, are an area where i would invest you know if you love quality sound you can get quality sound through great headphones for a tiny fraction of what you would have to pay for a great stereo system in a room so as long as you're not sharing it with other people mm. which is impossible with headphones of course uh, it's really worth investing in them because the better the headphones the less tendency to turn it up. If you're wearing cheap headphones, mm. which sadly many, many people are, and listening to low grade music, you know, um, very compressed MP3s or whatever it might be, the tendency mm. is to turn it up and turn it up and turn it up in order to get that bass going, in order to get the, tr the, the top end that you can hear. So that is a really big problem. And I would always say, if you're buying headphones for kids, get really good ones and teach them about their hearing so they can enjoy listening. You can certainly listen for hours on headphones, but not at 90 decibels. You know, 85 decibels is where yeah. hearing protection has to be offered in workplaces. And for hours of, com of, of comfortable and healthy listening, you'd really be looking at below 80 decibels. And there are guidelines on the web. You can look them up. Once you get to 100 decibels, the recommended limit is minutes, not hours. And sadly, there are kids mm. putting much more than that into their ears. So, uh, I, it, wow. I mean, the, the problem is the lack of feedback because you don't hear the damage. You know, it may be, I mean, I've, I've been to concerts. <laughs> I wrote in my book about, um, I remember going to see Leonard Skinner at Hammersmith Odeon in 1976, roughly. And uh, their PA stack was almost up to the ceiling. And when I came out, I couldn't hear anybody <laughs> talking to me. And it was days before I could hear again. <laughs> now, that's called a temporary threshold shift. Particularly, you can't hear s or t, you know, sibilance. Uh, that disappears. Well, if that happens to you, you've probably damaged your hearing. But as long as you don't do it too often, then you can get away with it just about. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you're a musician in Leonard Skinner, you go deaf. And there is an, a massive problem of musicians with deafness, classical mm. ones as well as rock uh, and DJs. Anybody who, who lives in an environment where they're constantly being bombarded with 100 plus decibels, it, the, the, the result is going to be hearing damage. So those are the tips. Teach children about hearing buy them really good headphones and buy yourself the best ones you can afford. You know, it's worth spending a few hundred dollars, not 50 on a really good pair of headphones. Yeah. You know, the Sony WHX, whatever they're called, they're excellent to the top of the range. Bose ones are excellent. Yeah. Um, you know, it's worth going that extra yard because you're protecting your hearing. You have a lovely experience and it's an investment that'll last you for years. Hmm. Thank you. That That's really good advice. Julian, we have the privilege of having you here. So I want to actually take advantage of it and ask a personal advice. So as a podcast host myself, what tips do you have for us to become better hosts? 
I'm not sure uh, of the equipment that you're using, uh, but it looks like you've both got a decent microphone. Uh, is that a road road podcaster? Can't see from here. It is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, a, a good microphone is essential. A, a good acoustic environment is really, really important as well. And the room I'm in has got, uh, you know, I, I fitted an acoustic ceiling. So the, the entire ceiling is sound absorbing tiles. Mm. Um, and it's got some wow. soft finishing. So the reverb in here is very low. It's not a recording studio, but it's um, it's pretty good. And I'm using, I've got just up here, a nice microphone, which is picking me up. Um, you're both using headphones, which is uh, entirely appropriate um, because the last thing you want, and I, and I have come across this, is, is that sort of feedback and uh, the echo that you get by having the sound coming out of loudspeakers and going back into a microphone. It's not, not a good look um i mean i th the the um the background is completely up to you i use a green screen many people who podcast use a green screen many don't and many you know lots of others like to uh to have what's going on in the background i'm not sure what webcams you're using uh, vlad you're looking a little bit blurry so uh i don't know what the webcam you've got on I is but it's slightly out of focus this is the iPhone camera I'm using. Okay. Well, you might want to clean the lens. <laughs> um, I, I use uh, I use an Elgato uh, face cam, which is very good. And again, if you invest just a hundred or two hundred dollars, oh, you can get yeah. something that's extremely good. And four K these days is easy to get, and it does make a big difference. Um, and then you know, as well as that, light is important. Uh, I have a a light just in front of me, which, you know, I can adjust quite easily. Um, and I've got a whole series of LED lights that I use for shooting video. Um, so I think these are the basic things. I mean, I would recommend these for anybody who's using virtual communication, actually. It's incredible how often I speak to people on Zoom where basically the shot that I'm looking at is up their nose because they have a laptop on the table in front of them with the screen angled back and the cameras at the top of the screen and they're kind of looming over it. Do you know what I mean? Very often with the light behind them. So they're a silhouette as well. It's quite scary. And these can be CEOs, you know, <laughs> having there was very serious people who've got a very nice laptop and they just have not thought about how they're presenting themselves to the outside world. So there's a lot to learn still in virtual communication and it doesn't take much to elevate yourself to a level that most people would say looks extremely professional. So definitely thinking about what's behind you, uh, the quality of the image that you're using, the quality of the sound that you're delivering. Um, I mean, I have a, a Rodecaster Pro mixing board here. Uh, I have an Elgato Stream Deck, which allows me to shift scenes. Uh, you know, I'm using OBS. Uh, which is excellent software. Uh, so mm. with OBS, you know, I can yeah. um, change my position very easily. Uh, I can disappear myself, um, you know, change the background. It's it's just a touch of a button. Uh, so these are all tools that are available now, and they're not very expensive, and they're quite easy to learn how to use. And then, of course, for editing, if you're doing a podcast, well, Descript. Do you use Descript? No, I mean Descript is it has changed. It's changed all the rules for video editing, and uh, it's changed all the paradigms. AI is now in play. The other thing I I can recommend for anybody who's doing virtual communication of any kind is Crisp K R I S P, which is an AI based algorithm that removes background noise. So I haven't at the moment got mm -hmm. children making noise next door but if i had you wouldn't hear them crisp is designed so that even in mm -hmm. say a call center an individual uh, call operative would be would sound like they're in a recording studio even if they got people on either side of them very very loudly talking at the same time it will take out everything tvs airplanes traffic noise drills whatever it is disappear completely and it gives you a much better quality wow. So th th those are some is it for software the post production help. or is it for the live live. 
Descript will do it in post-production. It's got an AI uh, add-on uh, called Studio Sound or something like that. I can't remember where you could record somebody. I mean, they've got a great demo of somebody who's recording it in a field with a, a freeway right behind him talking about something and you apply this uh, and it sounds like he's in a, in a studio again. All the background noise is gone. So, you know, the AI is changing audio and video post-production and live streaming dramatically. And it's worth keeping up on all of those things as a communication professional. Uh, that's certainly something I intend to do. Julian, thank you so much for that incredible advice. And we're going to finish off the interview with the one last question, which I love asking is who has been the most strongest or one of the most inspiring person in your life and what lessons have you learned from them? Well, I'm sure most people probably say this, but it would be my father uh, who was a, a very powerful guy in his field, which was advertising in the UK in the 1960s and 70s. He was a, a very leading figure. Um, he was highly competitive and very um, assertive guy. So he certainly taught me to be tough and logical in my thinking and uh, secure in my, you know, also we, we learn the difference between facts and opinions, which is a very important distinction. Um, so firm in my opinions and, and, and backing them up with facts where necessary. A couple of things that he liked to say, which have stayed with me uh, all of my life, really. Uh, one is the best is the enemy of the good. In other words, if you're obsessed with perfection, then you never really get anywhere very much because you could have got 90% of the way there by accepting that and then move on to the next thing and get 90% of the way there, whereas you're, you're still stuck back there trying to get to 100%. You can be doing that for a long time. So it's kind of the 80-20 rule, but it's, it's th that good is not always good enough, but quite often it is. And then we can move on to the next thing. So it's not about being sloppy. It's about aiming for the stars, uh, but knowing when you've achieved something that's going to deliver what you need, as opposed to being obsessed with perfection. Um, and the other one is uh, we start from where we are, which is a great phrase to remember uh, because it takes out regret and resentment and all those kind of backward looking negative emotions. We start from here this is where we are. You know, it's no point saying, if only we'd done that, or why, how do we get here, or any of this stuff. It's about acceptance. And, uh, you know, I have I have strong um, values, which I wrote, and it's part of my training course that I, I, I really suggest that people write down their values. And that's your North Star. That's your compass. That's how you know. If you're being authentic, it's how you know if you're being real. It's how you know who you are. And it is amazing how many people have never written down their values or never thought about it. And if you don't know, how can you know what is the right thing to do? So my values are faith, love, acceptance, and gratitude. And acceptance is, is very much that thing of we start from where we are. This is, this is what it is. Let's get on with it not wish it was otherwise and uh, that it also kind of counteracts the whole uh, the prevailing view i think in, in in a huge amount of modern economies which is that happiness is over there when i get that house i'll be happy when i get that new car when i upgrade my stereo when i have that you know new relationship i'll be happy happiness is always over there well no actually the only place happy happiness ever is is right here right now and that is very important to understand because over there is a mirage and if you're chasing that mirage your whole life you spend your whole life unhappy wishing you were somewhere else and it's very important to be accepting and uh, grateful for where you actually are wow julian thank you so much for sharing that advice with us i mean your journey. I, I want to first thank you for starting your journey. I mean, I've seen some of your videos that I think on YouTube, as far as I can find it, go maybe 12 years back, maybe a little bit more. 
I've probably watched every one of them that I can find on YouTube by now. It's it's incredible what you're doing. You are it's it's a very important message that you are also sending. I think everyone needs to understand and learn how to be a conscious listener. It's something that we need more than ever before. You know, as you were saying, 40, 40 years ago, okay, you know, maybe not. I mean, it, it's great, but today we need conscious listeners. We need to develop and we need to teach our kids how to listen. Julian, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. It was an absolute pleasure. Well, thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure. And uh, do let us know when this is coming out. In the meantime, I'll email it to you after this, the curriculum for the teachers so that you can make it available um, or have a link for people to download it. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store.